Brothers, sisters, respected ulama, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Imam Haythami has related in Majma Zwaid that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to send his message, he looked into the heart of the entirety of humanity and he found my heart to be the best. Thus he entrusted me with his message and then he looked into the hearts of the rest of humanity and he found my companions heart to be the best and he made them my aides and my ministers now let's ask ourselves a question why was it so important for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ensure that those who carry this message are of an upright trustworthy nature the reason for this was that Allah is pure his message is pure and therefore it was an imperative that those who carry the message be of a pure nature although Allah says in the Quran inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun we have revealed the dhikr the book and dhimanan the entire sharia comes into this and we are the ones that will look after it and one of the ways that Allah protects the message is that he creates men and women of an upright nature to protect the deen and similarly the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decree to take this knowledge in allah la yaqbidul ilma intiza'an that allah will not take this knowledge he will not snatch it up no he will take it up by the taking of the ulama so Allah sends the ulama because the al ulama warathatul anbiya. The ulama are the heirs of the prophets. How are they heirs of the prophets? They learn the knowledge and then they convey and they protect that knowledge. And one of the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose was no other than Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. He was the son of Thabit who was a Persian in descent. And whilst when Thabit was born, his father took him to Ali radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu made a dua for him and he made a dua for his progeny. And Thabit radiallahu anhu was of a very upright nature. The narration mentioned that one day he was doing wudu at a stream and an apple came down. And he picked the apple and he ate it. And later on, blood became came out of his mouth and he thought maybe the blood has come out of his mouth because he has eaten haram the apple belonged to somebody else so he walked up the stream and he found an apple tree and he found the owner of that land and he wanted to pay for the apple and the owner of the land said I will not take one dinar nor will I take a million dinar for the apple your redemption is that you marry my daughter why because the father was impressed by the taqwa of this young man he didn't look for the, as he got a q7 as he got a big bank balance is he from the exact same khandan or the clan or the tribe that we're from no what did he look for he looked for taqwa he looked for piety and Thabit began to think that the adhab of this dunya is easier than the adhab of the hereafter. And he agreed. And he married the mother of Imam Abu Hanifa who was of a very pious disposition as well. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, tayyibuna tayyibat The pure men for the pure women. And from this marriage came forth the manifestation of the dua of Ali radiallahu anhu. When Ali radiallahu anhu made a dua that Allah give you a pious progeny. This dua was accepted and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَوْ كَانَ الْعِلْمِ 
معلكا بثورية لا تناوله رجال من أبناء فارس if knowledge was suspended by the star of Thuraya, the Persians would seek knowledge. This was a general praise, the Prophet ﷺ said, that their zeal and their enthusiasm to seek knowledge, that if that knowledge was by Thuraya, they would attain that knowledge. And out of all the Persians in the Islamic history, whose knowledge benefited the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah more than the Knowledge of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah. No one. And this was acceptance of the dua. He was the Imam of the East and the West. Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahullah says, I came into a haram. And he says, I saw people from the East and the West, from all corners of the world, sitting and learning from Imam Abu Hanifa. As a poet, he says, Li Abi Hanifa manarun fil alum. مُلِيَتْ بِهِ الْأَفَاقُ وَالْأَقْتَارُ He said, Imam Abu Hanifa is like a lighthouse. He's like a lighthouse. He filled all corners of the world with his knowledge. He was the Imam of the rich and the poor, the kings and the scholars, millions of scholars, many of them who were Hufadul Hadith, meaning that they knew a hundred thousand Hadith of the top of their head, followed the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. And nowadays, you know, you get youngsters. And it is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. When the Prophet sallallahu said, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is when the latter part of this ummah will curse the former. I mean, I had a friend who went to school with me and then he changed one path. And one day he came up to me and he goes, you know, is it true that Abu Hanifa only knew 17 sahih hadith? I said, Subhanallah, on the basis of his 17 Sahih Hadith, they ruled with his fiqh half of the Muslim world. I said, if he knew a hundred Sahih Hadith, you guys would have never got a look in. But this is arrogance. He was a high Imam Dhahabi records him as being a Hafiz al Hadith. Hafiz al Hadith means a man who knows a hundred thousand Hadith with the chain of transmission. He memorized the Qur'an at a very young age. And then it seems that his father was a silk trader. He became engrossed in business. And one day the famous hadith scholar Shabi thought that it was his student walking past and he called him. Then he realized his mistake. But he ascertained from talking to Imam Abu Hanifa, this young man, that he was very intelligent. So Shabi asked him, he said, do you go to the gathering of the ulama? He said, no, very rarely. He said, don't be heedless, seek knowledge, because I see ability in you. And then it was then that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah stopped going to the marketplace. And the first knowledge that he ascertained was Asulud Deen, which is science for the protection of the deen. Many say he overindulged in Ilmul Kalam. It wasn't an overindulgement in Ilmul Kalam. It was Asulud Deen, because Imam Abu Hanifa lived in Kufa. Kufa was one of the places where all the divan sects existed. The Qadriya, the Jabriya, the Mu'tazalites, the Shias. Imam Abu Hanifa's own neighbor was a Shia. And this Shia named one of his donkeys Umar, na'udhu billah, and the other one Abu Bakr. And one day one of the donkeys kicked him. And it killed him. And they came and informed Imam Abu Hanifa that his donkey kicked him and killed him. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, go and see. I guarantee you that the donkey that kicked him and killed him was the one that he named Umar. And they went and exactly that was what had happened. And he became a master in the science. He himself says, wherever I would walk, people would say, this is Abu Hanifa. No man can debate with Abu Hanifa. The Qadriya, the Jabariya, no Batil Firqa wanted to debate with Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Even when the atheists came to Kufa, the governor looked for no other than Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. And they held this debate and there were thousands, if not hundreds and thousands of people there. And they're waiting and Imam Abu Hanifa hasn't turned up. And they're saying that Imam Abu Hanifa's bottled it. You know, he's scared. He hasn't turned up. And after a very long time, Imam Abu Hanifa turned up. And the atheist said, where you been? 
So what kind of Muslim are you? You give a time and you don't come on time? Imam Abu Hanifa should have said, you know, I'm a Pakistani Muslim, we're always late. And he said, I'm, I apologize, I'm late. But I live on the other side of the river. And I have to catch a boat to come onto this side of the river. But there was no boat. So what I saw is all of a sudden that a tree falls down itself. It cuts itself into planks. It comes together itself. And then it comes to me itself. I jump in it and I cross the river. And the atheist said, what a load of hocus pocus. He said, have you ever seen a tree fall down by itself, come together itself, and go across itself? And Imam Abu Hanifa said, game over, debate finished. He said, what do you mean debate finished? The debate hasn't even started. And Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah said, if a little boat cannot come together itself, then how did the heavens and the earth, the sea and the trees, the birds and the bees come together? Without a creator. And this was the intellect, well, intellect of Imam Abu Hanifa. Rahimullah. The truth is today we don't have the Imam Abu Hanifas. That is the truth. We don't have anybody who can rise to the challenge. And by the age of 20, Imam Abu Hanifa in the science of Asulud Din had the largest halqa in Kufa. By the age of 20. And one day a woman came and she asked him a masla regarding talaq and he didn't know it. And near his halqa was the gathering of Hamad ibn Abi Suleiman, a famous jurist, faqih. And he said, go and ask Hamad and come and tell me what Hamad says. So she went and asked Hamad and then she told him the answer. And the narration mentioned that Imam Abu Hanifa took his shoes and he went and he sat, put his shoes by the gathering of Hamad and for until Hamad did not die, Imam Abu Hanifa did not leave the side of Hamad. Rahmatullah alayhi. And this was destined. Because Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, was destined to codify the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Imam Abu Hanifa one day he saw a dream. That he's digging up the grave of the Prophet wasallam, And then he finds in the grave that the bones of the Prophet wasallam are scattered. And he puts the bones into order. And when he woke up, he was very perturbed. He was very perturbed. And he sent somebody to ask Ibn Sarin, the famous interpreter of dreams, about this dream. And Ibn Sarin said, the person who saw this dream, he will codify the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. And until Hamad did not pass away, Imam Abu Hanifa did not leave his side. It wasn't like today, you know, somebody studies six years or eight years in the Darul Uloom or six or eight years in some Jamia and he gives out fatwas. No, Imam Abu Hanifa had 4,000 teachers. Nine, seven of them were Sahaba, 93 Tabi'een and the rest were Taba Tabi'een. He sought knowledge. Knowledge how it should be sought. And this is why when some people now, they say things like, you know, yeah, he was a great Imam, but he didn't know how to pray Salah properly. What do you mean? Have some humility. He was the Imam of his time. If he didn't know how to pray Salah, his, t his students was Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Fadail ibn Ayaz, Imam Malik, Imam Yusuf, Imam Muhammad, Imam Zufar. He stayed six years in Mecca. If he didn't know how to pray Salah, they would have told him. He didn't need Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari came after him. Imam of his time and he didn't know how to pray Salah, have some humility. But these are the things that people come out with today. And until Hamad did not pass away, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah didn't leave his side. And when Hamad passed away, Imam Abu Hanifa was 40 years old. And then he started his own halaqa. And in, in Kufa, his halaqa became the largest halaqa. Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimullah says, I came to Kufa and I asked the people of Kufa, whose fiqh is the greatest fiqh? Who is the greatest faqih of Kufa? They said, Abu Hanifa. 
I asked them, who is the most muttaqi and who fears Allah? They said, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. And this is why Imam Abu Hanifa never took it lightly to give fatwas. Wallahi, Jafar bin Rabi stayed five years in, with Imam Abu Hanifa. And when he would give a fatwa, he would sweat like a river because he feared Allah. He inaugurated a shura of 40 people. And this was the first shura ever inaugurated. 40 mujtahids. And sometimes they would deliberate over one masla for over a month. And they say that sometimes Mabu Haniva would stand up and he would say, maybe we can't read a, reach a conclusion because of my sins. And he would stand up and he would pray two rakats. And he would cry in front of Allah and he would do tawbah. And when Fadail ibn Ayyad heard about this, who was Fadail ibn Ayyad? Fadail ibn Ayyad was known as Abidul Haramain, the worshipper of the two harams. Because they say that there was not a place in the two masjids where the tears of Fadail did not fall out of the fear of Allah. And when Fadail ibn Ayyad heard this, he was the student of Imam Abu Hanifa. He began to cry and he said the likes of Imam Abu Hanifa don't have many sins to do tawbah from. They don't have many sins to do tawbah from. When Waqib ibn al-Jarrah, somebody came up to him and they said Abu Hanifa makes many mistakes. And Waqib ibn al-Jarrah was the teacher, Imam Shafi and Imam Bukhari. He said, how could Abu Hanifa make many mistakes? And everybody makes mistakes. He said, but how could he make mistakes when he has students like Muhammad, Zuffar, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Daud al-Taif, Udayl ibn Iyaz, Kind al-Hiban. He said, if he made a mistake, they would put him right. And this is why I say what Farazduk said to Jareed. He said, how alai abai fajitni bi mithlihim. He said, these are my forefathers. You bring those who compare with them. And this is why, Wallahi, I feel more comfortable with the ijtihad of the predecessor than the mujtahid and the ijtihad of those of our contemporaries. And this issue about the doors of taqlid being closed. Look, we need, taqlid, we, sorry, the doors of ijtihad being closed. We need ijtihad. Ijtihad is important because we live in a dynamic world. Things change. But this about doing ijtihad 1400 years and you haven't sorted your salah out? Is that only thing you can do ijtihad on? 1400 years and you recreating the wheel again and again? Do ijtihad on things which really affect us. Which occur on a daily basis. This is ijtihad. Do ijtihad in Islamic finance. This is proper ijtihad. Not just recreating the wheel. And Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, his halaqa was the largest in Kufa. And I want to speak about a certain dimension of the life of Imam Abu Hanifa, which very rarely is mentioned. And that was the steadfastness of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. How he really feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Abu Hanifa lived under the Umayyads for 52 years and under the Abbasids for 18 years. And he was regarded amongst the Umayyads as the most knowledgeable from amongst them. To the degree that when the governor of Kufa wanted to choose a group of Qazi judges, he chose men like Ibn Shubrama, Ibn Abi Layla. And these guys, and these two are the narrators of the Siha. But he wanted to make in charge of all of them Imam Abu Hanifa. Rahimullah. And Imam Abu Hanifa declined the offer. And Ibn Hubayra became enraged. He said, take the post. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, I won't take the post. And the ulama, they came to Imam Abu Hanifa and they besieged him. They said, we beg you, take the post. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, I swear by Allah, if they asked me to fix the door of the Wasit Masjid, I wouldn't even do that. Do you want me to stamp? The execution of some innocent human being? He said, by Allah, death is easier for me than that I come on the day of judgment in chains. And Ibn Hubayra, who was second after the Khalif, took an oath 
that Imam Abu Hanifa would take the post. And Imam Abu Hanifa took an oath that he wouldn't take the post. And Ibn Hubayr summoned Imam Abu Hanifa. And he said, Abu Hanifa, take the post. For I swear by Allah, I will have you ripped over your head until you die. And the Imam Rahimahullah said, Innama hiya mitatun wahida. He said, do what you need to do, because you can only kill me once. Subhanallah, Imam Abu Hanifa wasn't just a faqih. It was, he wasn't just a muhaddis, but he was a mujahid. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ say, Afdul jihadi kalimatu haqqin in the sultan in jair? That the greatest jihad is that you speak words of truth in front of a tyrant ruler. And this is something that we need to learn from the life of Imam Abu Hanifa. We should be people who stand up for social justice. We should be people, you know, who protect other people. Not only when it is the Muslim cause. The problem with the Muslims is that we only stand up when it's a Muslim cause. When it's the issue of Islamophobia, you see non-Muslims in Britain who are at the forefront. When it is the issue of Palestine, you go to a march. The non-Muslims outnumber the Muslims 10 to 1. But when it comes to some non-Muslim issue, where are the Muslims? Where is the issue of social justice? This was the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. And Imam Abu Hanifa say, do what you need to do, for you can only kill me once. And Ibn Hubayra told the Jalad, he said, whip him over his head. And they whipped him once, and they whipped him twice. And when they struck him the third time, Imam Abu Hanifa screamed out. He said, Ibn Hubayr, I swear by Allah, the way you are disgracing me today, Allah will disgrace you like that on the day of judgment. And Ibn Hubayr shook. But wallahi, in the eyes of Imam Abu Hanifa at that time, it may have been disgrace. But today we remember it as honor. Because he stood up in front of a tyrant ruler. He stood up for what he believed. And his words shook Ibn Hubayr. And Ibn Hubayr told the Jalad to stop. And the Jalad stopped. And then they put Imam Abu Hanifa in prison. And every day they would offer him the post. And every day he would refuse. And every day they would whip him. Every day they would whip him. Until finally they couldn't break his resolve and they let him out and Imam Abu Hanifa exiled to Makkah for six years. He lived in Makkah for six years. And then he came back when the Khwarij were in charge. Now the Khwarij were a very interesting group. They believed, they didn't even spare Ali radiallahu anhu. They believed that anybody who believed in arbitration had committed kufr. Anybody who committed a major sin was a kafir. Anybody who disagreed with them was a kafir. So when they came into Kufa, one of the first people they found, they looked for was Imam Abu Hanifa. They brought him into the masjid. And their leader, the Haq ibn al-Qais said, Ya Sheikh Tub, O Sheikh do Tawbah. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, I do tawbah from all forms of kufr. So they let him go. Then somebody told him, you know what? He's been playing you. When he said, I do tawbah from all forms of kufr, he means your kufr. So they dragged him into the masjid again. And the haq said, you, you doing tawbah from our form of kufr. And Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah said, he said, tell me, your suspicion, is it a suspicion or is it based on certainty? He said, it's based on suspicion. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah says, Allah says in the Quran, Inna ba'da dhanni ithmun. Indeed, some forms of suspicion are a sin. Therefore, based on your own criteria, you have committed a major sin and you have become a kafir. So you do tawbah. So the haq did tawbah. Then he told Imam Abu Hanifa, you do tawbah. Imam Abu Hanifa said, look, are you ready to debate me? Or will you kill me? And the haq said, I'll debate you. Now this was the biggest mistake. You don't debate Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. So Imam Abu Hanifa said, what if we disagree? Then what? So he said, choose any person you wish. 
So he chose one of the Haq's colleagues and he said, The Haq, are you happy with his arbitration? The Haq said, Yes. Imam Abu Hanifa said, Look, the Haq, you did it. Spare Ali radiallahu anhu. You said, When Ali asked for arbitration, he has gone out of the fold of Islam. He said, Now you have accepted arbitration, you have committed kufr again. Do tawbah again. So the Haq did tawbah again. And the Khwarij, they believed that anybody who opposed them, their blood was halal and their women were halal for them. And when they went through Kufa, everybody went into refuge. And the narration mentioned, Imam Abu Hanifa came out and he asked the Haq. He said, the Haq had his sword drawn. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, Oh, the Haq, tell me, why are you killing these people? And he said, because they oppose us and they believe in arbitration. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, were they born on this? And then the Haq said, as a consequence, they have become murtads, apostates. So their blood is halal. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, he said, the Haq, tell me, were they born on this belief? Or did they change? He said, no, they were born on this belief. Then Imam Abu Hanifa said, if they were born on this belief, then they haven't become murtad. They were never Muslims in the first place according to you. And Imam Balaji rahmatullah alayhi says, the entirety of Kufa are indebted to Imam Abu Hanifa because he saved their necks. You hear about the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa, but look at the resolve of Imam Abu Hanifa. And then Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, when the Abbasids took over, Imam Abu Hanifa came back into Kufa. Initially, the Abbasids had a very good relationship with Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. And they allowed him to do what he wanted and he started his shtal when he started his shura. And Mansur who was the khalif of the time, Mansur who was the khalif of the time would come to Imam Abu Hanifa and ask him questions. When Mansur and his wife had debate regarding polygamy, you know the brother's favorite topic, it's nothing new, it's always been a topic amongst the brothers. The Khalif came to Imam Abu Hanifa and he said, Oh Imam Abu Hanifa, how many wives can a man have? And his wife was with him. He said, four. So he turned to his wife, he said, I told you, you can have four. Imam Abu Hanifa said, wait, that four is for them, those who are fair and who are just. And Allah says, if you fear that you cannot be just, then just one. And this was the Khalif. He was taken aback by the boldness of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. On another occasion, he called all the ulama. And he said, the people of Mosul made an agreement with me that if they rebel against me, their blood is halal for me. I can execute them. And all the other scholars said, oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, it's up to you. If you forgive them, that is good. But if you decide to execute them, that is also permitted because they gave you an oath of allegiance. And Imam Abu Hanifa remained quiet. And he said, what do you say Abu Hanifa? And Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, he said, O Mir al-Mu'mineen, they gave you allegiance over that thing which they do not own. They don't own their lives. Allah owns their lives. And you don't have the right to take their lives. And Mansur got enraged and he sent all the ulama back. But when it came, listen to this, when it came to making the Qadi of his time, who did Mansur choose? He chose Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. The Abbasides and the Umayyads, both of them chose Imam Abu Hanifa because they knew that there was no man who could compete with him in knowledge. And wallahi, this is the arrogance of it. You have youngsters who can't string three words of Arabic together and they can start slating the Imam. Oh, he was a murjah. He was weak in hadith. He had students who were fathers of hadith. How many people have followed the Hanfi fiqh throughout the centuries? Millions, billions, and millions of them were scholars. And those scholars, nobody could compete with them. And we don't follow one man. Remember this. No mother follows one man. We follow the school of thought, which had millions of scholars 
who looked at it, who refined it. And this is arrogance on the behalf of some. And the lack of knowledge. And Mansur offered him the post of being the Qadi al Qudat, the chief judge in the um, Abbasid kingdom. And Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, refused. He refused. And Mansur insisted. And Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, said, He said, Oh Mansur, if a case is brought against you, by Allah, I will pass verdict against you. And if you want me to retract it, I will not retract it even if you drown me in the Euphrates River. And he said, this is when I have taken the post happily. What about when you force me to take the post? And Mansur insisted. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, I'm not fit to take the post. And Mansur said, you're lying. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, see I told you a liar can't be a judge. And this enraged Mansur, in some narration, Mansur went to the Jalad, he took the whip and he began to whip Imam Abu Hanifa. How old was Imam Abu Hanifa? He was close to 70 years old. Resolve. People talk about, oh Imam Abu Hanifa, you just think he spoke about wudu? And salah? The reason that Allah accepted him as Imam of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah was because of his sacrifice. This is why Allah accepted him. You think Allah would have accepted the rule of Imam Abu Hanifa and his students for 1300 years ruling over the vast majority of the Muslim world? And Mansur put him into prison. And every day they would offer him the post. And every day he, when he would refuse, they would whip him. Until finally, they couldn't break his resolve. And the narration mentioned that they poisoned him. And when he realized that he was passing away, he fell into prostration. He fell into prostration. And Allah extracted his ruh whilst he was in the state of prostration. And the narration mentioned, the narrator who gave him the ghusl says that only five or six people knew that he had passed away. He said, but when we carried out his body, he said, by Allah, I have never heard people crying in that manner that they cried when he passed, when they saw his body. He said, over 50,000 people prayed his janazah. 50,000 people. For 20 days, people came to his grave and they prayed. And he, he bequeathed that he's not buried inside Baghdad because he regarded Baghdad as usurped land and when Mansur came to his grave he said why did you bury him here and they said because he regarded Baghdad to be usurped land and he didn't want his body to be buried in usurped land and Mansur turned to his grave and he pointed to his grave he said Abu Hanifa you tormented me in life but I can't even get away from you even after your death And Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimullah, wallahi, if I, maybe Allah gives me an opportunity, I will speak about Abdullah ibn Mubarak. He was a student, Imam Abu Hanifa. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, if Imam Abu Hanifa only had one student, one student, I was Abdullah ibn Mubarak, it would have sufficed. And Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he came to the grave of Imam Abu Hanifa, and he said, Oh Abu Hanifa, when Ibrahim Nakhi passed away, he left you in your shoes. He left you to fill his shoes. But after you, by Allah, nobody can fill your shoes. And somebody saw Imam Abu Hanifa in the dream and he was in a very blissful, happy state. And they asked him, he said, Allah elevated my status because of people would curse me and slander me. And Imam Shafi rahimahullah says, why did Allah allow the Sahaba to be slandered even after their death. Although they were people of elevated status after Anbiya, nobody re reached the status of the Sahaba. He says, because Allah wanted them to receive rewards even in their graves. And Allah wants Imam Abu Hanifa to receive rewards in his grave. And this is why he allows little boys on the corner streets to backbite. But it does nothing besides elevate the status of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Upon occasion, if Imam Abu Hanifa was here today, what would he have said? 
Upon occasion, a person said to Imam Abu Hanifa, he said, you bidati, you zindiq. Call him as heretic. And Imam Abu Hanifa began to cry. And he said, by Allah, since the day I believed, I have never turned away towards Islam. And I ask Allah to pardon me from the punishment of the hereafter. And the narrator mentioned when he reached the word punishment, he broke down and he began to sob. And the person who saw him, called him as Zindiq, he saw his sincerity. And he said, Shaykh, I ask you for tawbah. I ask you to forgive me. And Imam Abu Hanifa forgave him. He said, I forgive you. But he said, as for the ulama, as for the ulama, when they slander other people, they leave something behind them. Because people have a tendency of following ulama. And this is why my dear respected brothers and sisters, we should be careful of how we utilize our tongue, especially regarding the elders. Understand your status. When Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was asked regarding the controversy between the Sahaba, he said, Allah saved our swords from their blood. Now Allah save our tongues from disparaging them. And this is how we should be. And secondly, you know, for us who regard ourselves, eh, all Muslims, because we all follow the Salaf, we shouldn't just follow Imam Abu Hanifa in his wudu, in his, uh, the way he prayed Salah, or the fiqh of his Salah, but we should also follow him in his resolve, in his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the way he prayed Salah, the narration mentioned he would pray Salah, he was known as the peg. That entire night he would pray in Salah. Imam Dhahabi rahimahullah said that it is tawatur, that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah would stay up all night. All night doesn't necessarily mean wouldn't sleep at all. It means, and that's a whole fiqh issue I don't really want to open. It means he would pray for long, long periods of the night. And this is how we should be. We should take strength from these people's lives and we should endeavor to emulate them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in Jannatul Firdaus. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.